How are autos right now for you? An asterisk, an outlier, or are they part of the American economy? Well, they are part of the American economy. They're an important component of the American economy. Uh, they have been declining in value as a percentage of the overall economy for years, as is whole, most of manufacturing. But you have to remember, the automobile industry is a pervasive product. I mean, when you consider all the components going into them, whether it be glass, steel, yeah. electronic components, rubber components, plastic, leather, vinyl, I mean, it, it's a huge supply chain that's involved when you're talking about building oil automobiles. And therefore, its multiplier in terms of the economy is still very, very important. And when you see a retail sales numbers in autos like we did yesterday afternoon of a big drop down in sales to about 13.1 million units from about 14.8 million units, you really get the sense that this is where the economy is losing some of its momentum. And it is related to right. the supply chain because this is what's really happening in terms of the auto space. Stephen Rusciuto, a slow news day. Let us make some news right now. Are you going to reduce your Q3 GDP statistic? No, I mean, I don't, I don't get into that game of trying to, you know, fine tune it once we have all the data, the, the key source data coming out, because there's still lots of moving parts in there. I mean, I go back to the days when a couple of people from the Bureau of Labor Statistics who did these components were caught for insider trading, trying to change trade on the GDP number. Uh, oh, and John the does that. Was, excuse me? John does that. John trades off the GDP <laughs> number. We've seen him do it. And, and, and the net result is they made absolutely no money because they couldn't figure out what the numbers were because they weren't <laughs> still trading the inventory. <laughs> um, right. and, that's, and that's really the key issue. They, you know, Unless you know the trading, you know the inventory numbers, it's really, really hard to peg down the GDP number on a key source data related basis. That said, the direction matters. And I want to go back to that Morgan Stanley call of Ellen Zentner, where they downgraded the third quarter GDP to 2.9% from 6.5% previously. David Smith from Regions Bank said this is actually significant. And the reason why is because there isn't necessarily a material impact on the full year GDP. But there isn't a markup in the GDP for Q4. This is not delayed growth. This is lost growth. And I wonder how much that is starting to factor into people's assessment of this recovery. I think you're 100 percent correct. And I think that's the real key factor there is that this is not going to be growth that's going to be reversed back. When I look at the numbers that they've just put out uh, and they look at the big drop that they're anticipating in Q3 and then the bounce back they're anticipating in Q4, I'm not so sure you're going to get that bounce back uh, in Q4. There's a lot of people who keep on talking about pent-up demand in this economy. There isn't really any pent-up demand in this economy. So you might wind up seeing marking down third quarter GDP, really marking down the, the year number in particular and getting people to really look Look at their 2022 estimates and begin to realize that those numbers are much too high. We're still much lower than the consensus on 2022 numbers. We're in the three and a half percent area, and most people are substantially higher than that. And that's where we think the risk is from the kind of losses that you're talking about here for the third quarter. Meanwhile, we're looking at a labor economy that still hasn't recovered, and we're looking at millions of people still out of work. The why, though, behind it is less and less clear as a lot of the economy reopens. What are you hoping? hoping to find out from Friday's, from tomorrow's jobs report, to understand more the trajectory of what's keeping people uh, away from filling all those jobs, a record number of them that need to be filled. Well, I, I think what you're going to discover is, is what's true about most of these jobs, is that people are looking for a specific qualified person to fill a job. If you're going to be in a work-from-home environment for a lot of these jobs, and I'm not saying a lot of the service jobs are work-from-home related jobs, but outside the service component, you're looking for a person who is plug compatible. You put them in and they start working ASAP. Not in an environment when you're working home where it's easy to train somebody and bring them on board. So the net result is I think this work from home environment is one of the factors that is limiting the ability to find that specific worker that we want because those workers are rare. In an environment where people are working in offices, there is the ability to train, get people up to speed. Now we have less and less of that as an opportunity. So therefore, you really need to find that unique person. And that becomes harder and harder to do. It's finding a needle in a haystack. Steve, what's the dynamic on service sector right now? We mentioned earlier that the gigatechs are out 22.9% of Standard & Poor's 500. What's that mean for our service sector versus good sector? What it really comes down to is we're driving everything from a productivity standpoint. I know you looked at the 
productivity numbers here in the unit labor cost numbers. And you talked about the uptick in the unit labor cost numbers that we've had here. The reality is when you're looking at the productivity environment of the economy and the increased productivity that has been pushed into the economy as a result of the COVID-19 environment, it's understandable why you're seeing what you're seeing in terms of the growth-related uh, portions of the economy, in particular in the tech space, because we're relying more and more on that technology in this work-from-home environment. As you look at more and more companies who are sitting there saying we're delaying openings or making it easier for people not to come back to the office, uh, after Labor Day or in October. Uh, the net result is you're going to demand more and more on this type of technology, and that's going to continue to drive the demand up for that product. Uh, and so I think it just very, hits very, very much with the changes in the underlying dynamic that are unfolding as a result of the COVID-19 mitigation strategy. Meanwhile, throughout the show this morning, we've been talking about mitigation efforts to some of these storms that are historic. We saw what happened with Hurricane Ida over in Louisiana. In New York City, uh, the, uh, the weather system actually actually issued its first ever emergency flash fast flood emergency warning uh, not the fast flood uh, fast flash flood excuse me of warning but emergency warning trying to look at how people are possibly going to die what is the impact on gdp on growth on the resumption of people back into their jobs as a result of some of these storms you know, I will tell you, when we go back and look and trying to ascertain the impact of any particular storm, um, you know, you can go back and you look at Katrina, you can look at Sandy, and those were much, much bigger in magnitude. I'm not uh, arguing that the suffering going on by people right now isn't real and isn't important. It is. But the magnitude of it in terms of the population, the breadth of the economy involved in that are substantially greater. I don't expect to see much of a real statistical impact at the macro level. At the micro level, to a certain extent, you wind up seeing a lot of the expense, expenses that have come to recover from that wind up driving the economy back to fill that void very, very quickly, which is why statistically we don't see it on a quarterly basis. You'll see it in some of the regional monthly numbers, but you won't see it in the quarterly data.